So chapter 17 in our text goes over viruses and prions or prions. Um, I also want to talk about viroids and a bit more on bacterial genetics and horizontal gene transfer. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of a virus and why a virus is not considered living. We'll talk about host range, a couple different um, viral replication cycles. Um, and then how we can prevent infection and what to do after an infection has occurred. We'll talk about prions and then again we'll talk about viroids and bacterial genetics. So when we're talking about a virus, the structure of the virus contains nucleic acid, so either DNA or RNA, but not both. Um, also there's a capsid, which is a protein coat around that nucleic acid. Then you've got an envelope or envelope, which is the phospholipid layer. And then there's glycoprotein spikes, so proteins with a little carbohydrate tail that are gonna make up that envelope. So if we think about a virus, um, the nucleic acid is really going to function as the genetic instructions. The capsid helps protect the nucleic acid. The envelope helps to protect the viral particle and also camouflage it from the host immune system. And then the spikes are important for attachment and um, entry into the host cell. So that capsid is a protein shell that encloses the viral genome. Capsids are built from protein subunits that are called capsomeres, and they can have various structures. So there's just a couple examples of capsid shown there. The one on the end is a bacteriophage, which is those viruses that infect bacteria. So if we think about envelopes on viruses, viral envelopes are typically derived from the host cell's membrane, but sometimes they come from the nucleus as well, and they can contain a combination of viral and host cell molecules. Um, envelopes can help viruses infect the host. Um, so it's kind of like the idea of a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? So the wolf is hiding in the middle there between all the sheep and it's hard to recognize him. Um, so having a piece of your host cells um, membrane around you kind of camouflages you from the host cell's immune system. So viruses can infect many different cell types. Viruses can infect both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Um, bacterial viruses are called bacteriophages or sometimes just phages. And then eukaryotic viruses can infect plants, animal, fungi, and even protists. So when we think about where viruses came from, that's kind of tricky. Um, since viruses require host cells to replicate, they may have come from cells and not before cells. Um, so they maybe came from plasmids, which are those extra chromosomal pieces of DNA and bacteria, or they may have come from transposons, which are these so-called jumping genes um, that move from one segment of DNA to another. So we're not really sure um, where viruses came from. So let's rank the following from smallest to largest. So we've got a bacterium or a bacteria, so singular is bacterium, then virus and a human skin cell. So the virus is the smallest, then bacteria, then a human skin cell. So virus is one, bacteria two, and human skin cell three. Um, true or false, do viruses, or sorry, true or false, viruses have ribosomes. So that's false, viruses don't have any organelles, so they don't have ribosomes. Um, number three, why are viruses typically not considered living? This one's a little tricky because like how do you kill something that's not alive, right? But viruses are typically not considered living because they don't have any of their own organelles. They require a host cell to replicate and they don't have the ability to replicate on their own. Like they, they lack the metabolic machinery to do so. So viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, meaning they have to replicate with inside a host cell. The host range um, is going to be the different kinds of cells they can infect. Um, so normally it's a limited number of cells because they require a match between um, viral surface proteins and host cell surface proteins. So the host cell surface proteins aren't necessarily meant for the virus to bind to and get into, but the virus is going to take advantage of those proteins that are already on the host cell. So each virus is limited to a certain species or even a certain tissue type. Um, you've probably heard of West Nile and equine encephalitis, maybe at least West Nile. Um, those can infect mosquitoes, birds, horses, and even humans. Um, but then if we look at measles, it can only infect humans. And then the human cold viruses can only infect um, cells lining the upper respiratory tract. So there's just a couple examples of the viral host range. 
So viral replication um, is how viruses reproduce, and I sometimes slip and say reproduction, but technically since they're not alive, it's probably better to say replication. Um, and really this isn't the same for every virus type, but it typically is going to include um, entry and uncoding. So they have to enter into the host cell by attaching to the host cell, and then the viral nucleic acid uncoats its protein capsid that surrounds it. Then in replication, the host cell is going to ma manufacture um, viral and nucleic acid using the host enzymes, ribosomes, tRNAs, amino acids, and so on and so forth there. Um, so we're going to have to have transcription and manufacture of capsid proteins, and then self-assembly where the viral particles assemble, and then the viral particles are going to exit the cell, which usually damages or destroys the host cell. So here's just kind of a general schematic of that. Um, over on this first side of the slide, um, the picture showing you the virus um, entering into the cell. This is a super simplified diagram. So they're not showing you the proteins binding um, from the virus to the host cell's receptor proteins. Um, with replication, they're showing you viral DNA is being replicated. It's used to make viral mRNA, which is used to make viral proteins. Um, the viral DNA is replicated to make more viral DNA. Um, and then it all gets packaged together and the new viral particles are going to exit the cell. Um, here's just a picture of phage assembly. So the particles are replicated separately and then combined. So I like this picture because it does a good job showing you, you know, the head and the tail pieces and the tail fibers all replicating separately and then being combined. So phages are really the best understood of all viruses um, and they've got two main replication mechanisms. One of the reasons phages are so well understood is because it's so easy to grow bacteria in a lab and there's not really too many people who have ethical concerns about what you do to the bacteria in the lab. They maybe have ethical concerns about what happens to those bacteria in the lab, like making sure that they don't get introduced into a population. But no, there's like no people for the ethical treatment of bacteria telling you you can't get them infected with viral particles. Um, but anyhow, there's two main replicative cycles of phages. The lytic cycle, which ultimately accumulates in the death of the host cell. Um, in this cycle, it produces new phages and then lyses the host cell and releases the viral replicates. Um, phages only used by the lytic cycle are going to be called virulent phages. The lysogenic cycle is when the viral nucleic acid is actually going to be incorporated into the host cell's chromosome. This is now known as a prophage. Um, when it has that viral um, DNA incorporated into its chromosome. So the cool thing about this cycle is whenever the host divides, it copies the phage DNA as well, and it passes those copies onto all the daughter cells. This means that one infected cell can really produce a population of prophages carrying around the virus. And then when the environment is right, it can trigger the virus genome to exit the bacterial chromosome and switch to the lytic mode. So go ahead and label the lytic and lysogenic cycles in this picture. I'll give you a moment, or actually go ahead and pause it and think about it and then come back to me. So if we look at the first picture on the left hand side, you've got the phage entering in, making copies in, breaking out immediately. So that's going to be the lytic cycle. Um, and then the lysogenic cycle is over here on the other side. Um, so the phage, if we're still looking at a picture of phage came in here, affected the host cell, and then it goes into pr the prophage form. So every time this cell makes a copy, the viral DNA is copied as well, and we've got this daughter cell with a prophage as well. But it can be triggered to flip into um, the lytic cycle. So bacteria don't want to be infected by phages, just like we don't want to be infected by viruses. Like it's much better for our cells if they make what they need instead of viral replicates. Um, so some things that protect against phages are mutations that don't allow the phages to bind to the surface of the cell so then they can't get in, um, or restriction enzymes that cut up any foreign DNA um, restricts the ability of the phage to replicate. And then we talked about CRISPR-Cas9 before. So the CRISPR-Cas system can actually cut out phage DNA um, from the bacterial chromosome so it can edit that out. 
So that brings us to animal viruses. Animal viruses can have a genome of either DNA, like most phages, or RNA. They can also have envelopes. Um, the envelope is going to include molecules from the virus and then molecules from either the plasma membrane or the nuclear membrane of the host cell. And the envelope is going to be studded with glycoproteins and used to enter into the host cell. So here we've got a picture of that. We've got um, up here, there's your viral RNA, there's the capsid, and here's the envelope with glycoprotein spikes. So it enters into the host cell. Um, the viral RNA can be used to um, either make more RNA, oops, sorry, it's on this side, either make more RNA or make mRNA, which is used to make proteins. Um, the proteins can be used for the capsid, or the proteins can be used for the envelope. Um, and then we assemble the RNA, the capsids, the nucleic acid um, together. And as the viral replicate leaves the host cell, it picks up the envelope from the cell membrane and you get a new virus. So, um, Animal viruses that use RNA as a viral genetic material can use three different mechanisms for this. The RNA could be read as mRNA and translated immediately. The RNA could serve as a template for mRNA, so they do RNA, <laughs> they do RNA to RNA synthesis using viral enzymes, or the RNA could go to DNA, and to do that it has to use a reverse transcriptase um, to copy the RNA genome into DNA. So HIV is an example of a virus that does that. Um, if we think about what transcription is, remember transcription is from DNA to RNA. So if we did that process in reverse and went from RNA to DNA, that would be reverse transcription. So the enzyme that does reverse transcription is called reverse transcriptase. So that's a pretty good name for that one. Um, so, I don't know that anybody ever listens to these, so the bonus question on our next exam is going to be about retroviruses and reverse transcriptase. So, there you go. Know that if you want two extra credit points. So, anyhow, um, viral DNA that's integrated into, or sorry, viral DNA is then integrated into the host genome, right? So it goes from RNA to DNA, and then that DNA is plugged into the host genome, and it becomes um, a permanent resident of the host cell, um, and it's called, now the host cell is called a provirus. So the host cell's RNA polymerase then transcribes the proviral DNA back to RNA. Um, and then the RNA functions both as mRNA for the synthesis of viral proteins and as genomes for new viral replicates. So here's a really terrible resolution picture of this. I'm not quite sure why the resolution is so bad on this one, but we've got HIV here as our example of a retrovirus. Um, it brought along its own reverse transcriptase, that little green glob that you can see. Um, so you've got glycoprotein spikes here, you've got a viral envelope, you've got the capsid, it has to be able to bind receptors on the host cell, um, the particle enters and um, the, the capsid dissolves, um, and then to go from RNA to DNA, the host cell uses or the virus uses reverse transcriptase, so now we have DNA, that DNA can be integrated into the host cell's um, genetic material and then read and um, the DNA is used to produce mRNA, which is used to produce proteins, um, and then also it's used as the genetic material um, for the next generation of viral replicates. So just like bacteria, animals really don't want to have viruses either, right? They want to use their host cell, or they want to use their cells machinery for themselves. So, um, Animals that have mutations that don't allow viral entry are going to be protected from viruses. So here's the picture from our textbook showing that um, the HIV virus has to be able to bind to a CD4 receptor on a helper T cell and also a CCR5 receptor. Um, but if the cell has the CD4 receptor but no CCR5, um, the viral particle cannot bind, so then it can't enter into the cell, so that cell would be protected. Um, we can also use vaccines to educate our immune systems um, so they will be more prepared 
when an actual virus that's not weakened or a derivative of that virus comes to attack us. And there are some antiviral drugs we can use as well. Um, they mainly interfere with viral replication and they're not perfect. Um, there's nucleosides which interfere with viral nucleic acid synthesis and protease inhibitors with, which interfere with um, viral enzymes. So those are some things we can do against viruses, but ultimately kind of, you know, um, taking precautionary measures is a pretty good idea when it comes to combating viruses. So what enzyme is required for a virus with an RNA genome to produce cDNA or complementary DNA? So to go from RNA to DNA, what would you do? You would do reverse transcription. So the enzyme that does that, slap an ACE on the end and you get reverse transcriptase. Number six, true or false, some viruses can infect bacteria. That's true, bacteriophages can infect bacteria. I'm not sure why students struggle with that, maybe because you think bacteria get you sick and viruses get you sick, but bacteria can get sick as well. Um, number seven, how does a virus gain entry into a host cell? Uh, it has to be able to bind to receptors on the host cell membrane. So that brings us to prions, or some people say prions, and how these um, molecules cause disease is not very well understood at this point in time. Um, the best way we can talk about it or the most we know is that it's an infectious protein um, and it differs from the proteins that are normally found in nervous tissue only by its higher order structure. If we talk about higher order structure, remember with protein structure you have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Um, so when the proteins fold, that's the higher order structure. The primary structure is the order of amino acids. So what we're saying is prions have the same amino acid sequence, but they're misfolded or abnormally folded. And unfortunately, this abnormal fold is much more stable than the normal fold. Um, and this incorrectly, for, incorrectly folded form um, aggregates, and that's going to interfere with normal cell function. So prions act very slowly. I'm talking like an incubation period of about 10 years. And prions are virtually indestructible. Like regular cooking doesn't kill them. There's no known cure for prion diseases. Really all we can do is support people who've had it. And prion diseases have only been found to affect nervous tissues. Um, so this makes this kind of a concerning um, disease. So some examples of prion disorders are um, Crutzfeld-Jacobs disease or CJD, which is spontaneous. It could be genetic with fatal familial insomnia or infectious, like through ingestion, like mad cow or kuru. Um, you've probably heard of mad cow before. And mad cow didn't really make cows angry. It made them wobbly because of a lack of control in their nervous system. Um, kuru is um, passed on through cannibalism. Um, so those are just a couple examples of prion disorders. You've maybe heard of chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. That's another prion disease. So viroids are not covered in our textbook, but I think they're worth talking about it. They're um, infectious RNA that do not have a protein coat. And so far, we've only found them infecting plants. Um, some, some of them replicate within the host cell nucleus and others use the host cell's chloroplast. Um, and potato spindle tuber viroid is an example of this. It causes those kind of funny shaped potatoes. So why is it a concern if one cow in a herd shows symptoms of mad cow disease? Um, this is a problem because we don't know how it's passed on and there's no known cure and there's no good way to sanitize equipment. So it's especially concerning if that's your livelihood. Um, and how is a viroid different from a virus? So viruses can infect all kinds of different organisms and we've only found viroids infecting plants. Also viruses have a capsid and viroid, viroids are just a negative RNA strand without a capsid. So the text doesn't really cover bacteria in this chapter, but I think it's worth talking about them again. Remember, bacteria are prokaryotic and they have a single circular chromosome with extra chromosomal DNA in the form of plasmids. And bacteria reproduce asexually by binary fission like we talked about before, but they can exchange DNA through three unique mechanisms. Um, they've got conjugation, transformation, and transduction. And conjugation is the only um, place where the donor bacteria donor bacterium will actually live. 
So conjugation involves a sex pillus or conjugation pillus, which is like a protein tube that um, a plasmid will be passed from one bacterium to another in. Transformation we talked about before. This is when genes are transferred from one bacterium to another through the environment. And they can only do this when they're competent, and they're only competent when they're very, very, very stressed. And we already talked about this particular experiment before where the live R strain and the heat killed S strain can um, kill the mouse, and when you culture the bacteria from the mouse, you get um, live S strain. I like to throw in cartoons occasionally. Um, it says Hans is feeling rather incompetent today, but really if Hans was incompetent, he would be happy because he would be not nearly dying. All the ones who are smiling and happy looking and competent, um, they're nearly dying. And I guess maybe that's that smile you have before everything goes really, really poorly or when you can't do anything else. But anyhow, Hans is feeling rather incompetent. So transduction is another method of DNA transfer by way of bacteriophages, and this occurs when viral replication happens, and instead of packaging um, viral DNA into new viral particles, it packages host DNA into new viral particles. So transduction requires the bacteriophage to go from one bacterium to another. So do bacterial cells reproduce sexually or asexually? That is asexually. And if we match the pictures below here, um, in the first picture, we've got um, a bacterium picking up genetic material from the environment. So that's going to be transformation. In the second picture, the bacterium is picking up um, a plasmid from another bacterium through a um, tube, basically. So that's um, conjugation. And then the last one involves a viral infection. So that is transduction. So that's all we had for chapter 17. We talked about viruses. Um, we talked about hosts for viruses. We talked about different replication cycles. And um, we talked about prions and viroids and horizontal gene transfer in bacteria again.